Well, we are starting a, um, a new series this morning. It's uh, a series about uh, finding purpose. Finding purpose. And uh, it's going to be a fun series. This is one of, of many. And uh, I've, had a, I've had just a, a real delight as I begin to uh, rehearse in my mind what, what my purpose is. And uh, this, is, this is really um, an important message. And I don't know any, any other, uh, I don't know a better way to convey a message about purpose um, outside of me telling you what my purpose is. <laughs> and so I figure we'll start there. So I'm going to tell you a story. Because when I hear a story, here's a story. When I grew up, I grew up in, um, I grew up in, in St. Paul, Minneapolis. I also grew up in the western, uh, the western suburbs of Minneapolis, and as I, as I grew up, I went back and forth. <laughs> I was like a, the proverbial uh, uh, a ping pong ball, going back and forth and back and forth and back. See, when I got uh, when I got too much to handle, my uh, my dad said uh, said you know you need to be with your mother, and uh, then when I was too much for my mother, you know you need to be with your father. When I was too much to handle, you'd go be with your mother. And, and now, ironically, what happened with all of this is, is uh, I, I changed school districts repeatedly. Because as they moved, the school district changed. And so I went from, from one school to another school to another school, 13 public schools. I just went back and forth, back and forth. And I, I was thinking, I was talking to Beverly a little bit. She, she had a similar situation. And that most people, my wife went to the same school. I, and I say, that is boring. <laughs> I mean, you can't get in any trouble that way. You know, when you go back and forth and you know that, like, I'm not going to be here long, you get into more trouble, you know. And, but I, I grew up this, this, uh, this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth thing. And uh, in my family, my family, see, my mom and my dad were divorced. My mom had been divorced a, a couple, three times, two times. And the guy she's with now, I just love him to death. He's, he's, he's my dad. He's my dad. And, uh, but they, really, they didn't know God. I didn't grow up in a, um, in a solid Christian home, you know? And, and I think, um, I, was, I was actually telling somebody that, and they said, no way, you're a pastor. You had to grow up in a solid Christian upbringing. I said, no, actually, I, my folks didn't know God. Now, God knew them, but, but they didn't know God. They weren't saved. They didn't go to church. We went to church maybe once a... I don't know, once a year. We were a typical, typical family, I, I think, in America that goes on Christmas or, or Easter or Christmas and Easter. Uh, we tried to avoid church, to be honest with you. So <laughs> to, to my mother's surprise, when I said to her, I, I said, yeah, I'm going I'm to throw away three years of college in northern Minnesota. I'm going to go to Bible college. And she, I said, I'm going to go to church three times a week. And she thought I was joining a cult, just telling you. But you know what? Something happened. Something happened between growing up not knowing God and a decision to go to Bible college. Something happened there. Something happened with me, in, inside of me. And it was the most important thing that's happened in my life ever. It wasn't getting married to my wife. Now, it's important. But it's more important than that. It's a time that I came to the understanding that I was a sinner. I was in need of a savior. Jesus saved me from my sin. The penalty and the power of my sin. But something else happened. I began to know something that my folks didn't know. I began to know the Lord. And as I began to know the Lord, I began to find what we call purpose. Find what we call, something called meaning. Now we know that when we find things, it's a great joy. It's a tremendous joy. Any of you lost your car keys or your wallet? Right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's always a joy to find your wallet. Unless you've canceled all your cards. And then it's not a joy any longer. 
It'd be like Jesus coming back to the garden and finding his disciples sleeping. That's not a joy. (laughs) Or Jesus finding the money changers in the temple and overturning the tables. There's no joy there. But for the most part, finding something is a great joy. It's like, I've never won the lottery, but I can only assume, okay? Only can assume for a moment, it's like winning the lottery. You find something you've been looking for, especially after you've been looking for it for a while. Doesn't that get even more exciting when you've been looking? I mean, if you're looking for your keys, you're like, man, I can't find my, oh, there they are. You know, you find them. But when you're flipping over the couch cushions and you're asking, you're like, honey, now, retrace my steps, retrace my steps. And you ever do that? You ever, you're like, I got to sit down. I got to sit down. And you sit down, you're like, all right, I got out of the car. I had a book. I went to the mailbox. I went from the mailbox to the house. Where did my keys go? <laughs> I got in the door. I unlocked the door. I sat my keys down. And, and, and now you're, because you're looking for it so intently, when you find it, it's that much more joyous, isn't it? And I tell you what, when you find purpose in your life, when you find something you've been looking for, when you find the meaning of life, it's exciting. I, I liken it to the story in John. In John chapter 1, there's a wonderful story. Jesus comes on the scene. He, uh, he comes on the scene. John the Baptist has been baptizing. And he tells John, he says, I need you to baptize me. And now you can imagine John the Baptist is like freaking out. And he's like, whoa, wait a second. Uh, you know, baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And he makes this declarative statement, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. John the Baptist had had seen, had found the Messiah. And when you get to John chapter uh, 1 verse 41, there's a fellow whose name is Andrew, and he says this, speaking of Andrew, and first findeth his own brother Simon. So Andrew now finds Simon, and he saith unto him, we have found the Messiah's. Now, I cannot say that without passion. I can't say that with like, hey, yeah, we found the Messiah. He's over there. I got him right there. Which is being interpreted to Christ. Then it goes on, and in verse 45, Then Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him! I mean, finding something is so wonderful. And let me tell you, when you find... God, when you realize that there is a God in heaven who loves you and came to this earth to die for you, it's amazing, it's radical, it's transformative, it, it, it adds energy and excitement, and, and you can't just say, I can't preach this message like this. I'm excited to be here and preach on the Messiah. I mean, you got to get excited about this. These guys were excited. When I find something, I'm just lit up. I found something. I found something of great value. And you see, when you find something that has no value, you're not excited about it. That's why your keys are so important. And why your wallet is so important. Because it's of great value. You're excited when you find your wallet. I'm excited when I find someone else's wallet too, but I'm mostly excited when I find my own wallet after losing it. This is an exciting message, and here's why it's exciting. Because it's going to add dimension and depth and reality and excitement to your life as you begin to find purpose in yours. What in the world are we here for? This is an exciting time. I begin to think of how this is expressed throughout all of our lives and how this this literally impacts every single area, every nuance in your life, every crevice. Finding purpose is exciting. I I, I would say that most people are doing one of two things. They're either looking for something they can't find, or they have looked for something they have not found. Either it's present tense or past tense, but I'm telling you what, people are looking. People are looking. One of the main reasons why people don't find what they're looking for they're looking in all the wrong places. 
It's easy to find what you're looking for if you're looking in the right places. My dad was a, he could have probably played amateur uh, pool for, uh, you know, I don't know what you call it, c- competitively. And he said to me, we had a, we had a nine foot pro pool table in, in our house. Uh, it was in our basement. We never went down there. The house was so big, but we, we had it down there. We played from time to time. This is what my dad said to me. We were shooting billiards, pool, and, uh, and I was trying to get the eight ball in. You know, that's crucial, isn't it? You got to get the eight ball. You don't want to get it in first. You want to get it in last, right? And, and I said to him, I said, Dad, I said, you make the game look so easy. And he took two, he took two balls. He took, he took the white, white ball and black ball, and he put the white ball next to the black ball in front of the hole. And he says, can you make that shot, Joe? I said, well, yeah, Dad, I can make that. I said, hey, anybody can make that. And he says, if you always get the white ball next to the black ball, you'll always make an easy shot. And so what we call it, we call it cue ball control. Any of you play pool? Anybody ever play pool? You all know about chalking your cue and then you have to hit it, you have to hit the ball just right and you can get backspin, forward spin. I get that baby to do this and then, and then jump a little bit and I can get that thing off the table. That's usually not on purpose. But I can do all this crazy stuff. Now my dad is good. And all you have to do is, is, is make that happen. You just have to put the ball in, in line with the other, and, 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 and you always make an easy shot. And you see, finding something is always easy when you're looking in the right spot for it. It's like that, you know, I was over at a friend's house on, on, uh, on Friday. He was doing my taxes for me, because mine are kind of complicated. But anyways, he's doing my taxes, and we're, I, was, I was raiding his kitchen. You know how it is, you get a couple guys together, and I'm like, Jake, where's the food? And he's like, it's over there. So I grab the food and I throw it on there, and, and I start to look for plates. Why would you put plates so far away from the food? Doesn't make sense. Are you telling me I have to, Jake, I, so I'm looking through all these cabinets, and I'm, I start with next to the fridge. That would only make sense, right? You get the plates. Next to the fridge, the silverware drawer is right there. Generally, when you, when, when you design a, a kitchen, you want to put, you want to put the, the, everything in. It's, got, it's called the work triangle, right? So here it is. I'm looking through all the cupboards, and I'm fine. And I get to the last cupboard. And I, and, and I said, ha, there it is. And I said, it's in the last place I looked. And he says, well, I hope it is. And I said, Jake, if you would have put it where I would have put it, it would have been in the first place I would have looked. And you see, that's how it is with us. What we're looking for is oftentimes in the last place we look. When people look for happiness, they're looking in the wrong place. That's why they can never find happiness. When they're looking for something specific, you have to know where to look to find it. That's why purpose is so important. We're finding purpose in our lives. We're finding purpose in our lives. Now, Finding purpose is important or else we're going to be like, we're going to be like uh, Israel. We're going to be like the Jews after captivity for 430 years in Egypt. I've said this to people. I said it was an 11 day journey. 11 day journey to go from captivity to the promised land. 11 days. It took them 40 years to figure this thing out. Now, interestingly, interestingly, they just kind of wandered around, not trusting God, but God had a destination for them. 11 days took them 40 years. It's like road construction. Just saying. It takes them so long. If they would just put all the guys in one area. You ever do that? Have you ever seen a cone storage yard anywhere? Either have I. You want to know why? They just leave them on the road. Sorry, that's a pet peeve. (laughs) They just do. You drive for miles. Perfectly paved. It's been like this for a year. Cones are in the ditch. And I'm like, I know this guy's waiting to bring him to another job. Whatever. It's true, and you know it. You see, finding purpose gives you an exciting life. Gives you an exciting life. It's not boring. Here, let me tell you what's boring. This is what's boring. The rat race is boring. Okay? You ever feel like you're a hamster stuck in a wheel? 
and you're fed by one of those little gerbil bottles and you're crazy, boring. I look at a hamster, I'm like, these poor critters. Like, I would hate to be them. We're like a little fish in a fishbowl. Just sitting there. Around in a circle. You know it's bad. It's boring. It's got to be sad. They get up. It's like this. This is, this is what no purpose does. This is what no purpose does. You get up, you eat, you go to work. You come home, you eat, you go to bed. You get up, you eat, you go to work. You come home, you eat, you go to bed. The same thing over and over and over and over again. Nobody likes that. How many of you like the rat race? Raise your hand. None of you better raise your hand. Jana. The pastor's kids raise their hand. You like it, huh? All right, well. We have school this afternoon. I think we have school this afternoon. Show them what the rat race is. Now let's talk about this. What is purpose? What is purpose? Okay. If you look up in a, in a, in a dictionary, what purpose is, there's really kind of two different definitions that are, there's kind of polar opposites, okay? One definition of purpose, get this, one definition of purpose is the goal. That's the destination, okay? That's, that's one purpose. So the purpose is, what are we doing this for? What are we doing this for? That's one definition. Now, another definition for purpose has to do with the reasoning behind what you do. What's the purpose for what we do? It's not what we do, but it's the reasoning behind what we do. Now, for, for this message, I want to I talk a little bit about, about both, but primarily when we talk about purpose, we're talking about the end result, the back of the envelope, not the reason for why we do what we do, and we'll talk about that later, but I want to talk about what we do. What is our purpose in life, our goal, our, our end result? And I would say that everybody, at some point in time, if you're honest with yourself, you have wondered at least a little about your purpose in life. And I would venture to guess that if you've wondered a little more than that, you've looked for your purpose in life because you don't like the rat race. You don't like doing things where there's no goal. I'll tell you two reasons why this is important. Two reasons. One reason, life is short. Life is short. Every time I turn around, my kids get a half inch taller. I mean, I'm telling you, literally, and this is something your parents have told you and you disregarded. You just wait that fast, they'll grow up, and you're like, yeah, whatever. My kids, I, can't, I can hardly look over their head. Life is short. Matter of fact, James talks about it as a vapor. He says, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a short time and then vanished away. That's what he associated life with, vapor. In the Psalms, he actually gives, the psalmist gives a, 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 basics, a, a basis for how long life is. We talk about uh, what life expectancy is. And we say, oh, but it was so much longer back then. And now life is so short. And, well, the average life expectancy is about 75. Well, let's see what the psalmist says. He says this. He says, the days of our years are three score and ten. Three score, score is 20. So three times 20 is 60, plus 10 is 70. Ah, interesting. And if by reason of strength, they are four score years, well, that's 80. So between 70 and 80, the average is what? 75. I'm just telling you, the Bible is accurate. That's about life expectancy. Life is short. The longer we wander in the wilderness, we are in trouble. The longer we wander without any destination as to where we are going, we are going to have a problem. Because it's boring. It's boring. Here's a second reason. Not only is it a waste of time and life is short, 
But secondly, we don't feel fulfilled if we're not doing what God has called us to do. We don't feel fulfilled. Boy, this, 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 there's no, no news in either one of these. There is no joy in doing something you haven't been called to do. Because why? Because we're in a rat race. 1 John 1, 4 says, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. John 15, 11 says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. A verse I used a couple weeks ago, Wonderful joy, thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. You know, we don't have this kind of joy when we're wandering around not having a destination. Nobody likes not knowing where they're going. Just kind of circling the Sinai Peninsula. Is there we are. We're just kind of going around. Now I said they did have a destination. Now they didn't embrace the destination though, did they? Because that would only taken them 11 days. God said we're to have full joy. But you're not going to have fullness of joy if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Or if you are doing what you're not supposed to be doing. You have to figure out what God has for you to do and do that. And I tell you, when you do that, oh man. Phenomenal. When you do what God wants you to do, what it's your calling in life, there is full joy. Now, biblically speaking, this is easy. It really is easy. I, I, love, I love speaking biblically because I just go right to the Bible. Biblically speaking, it's easy. Because we just look for the commandments. It's like when, when I tell my kids to clean their room, they have their purpose. It's to clean the room. It was given to them by me because I said to clean your room. And so when we look at the commandments of God, we just have to do a survey. You have to do a survey of what God has required of us. What has God told us to do that we're not doing? And that's why we don't have fullness of joy. And what is it that, what is it that we can be doing that's in line with what it is God has for us and we'll find fullness of joy? In thy presence is fullness of joy. That's all we have to do. We have to find the commandments of God. So for the next four hours, this is when you laugh. Everybody's like, rrr, rrr, rrr. <laughs> let's talk about what the purpose of purpose is. What is the purpose of purpose? What is the purpose of purpose? Well, it's what keeps you doing what it is you're supposed to be doing. The purpose for purpose is to keep you doing what it is you're supposed to be doing. Now again, as I said, there's two definitions of purpose. One definition is the goal. That's the, that's the, that's the, the, the destination. And the other is the discipline. That's how to get why it is we do what we do. One is where we're going, and the reason is why are we going there? Now, I don't know how many of you like to do things you don't know why you're doing it, but I venture to guess that a lot of us do those sorts of things. And in the rat race, that's just all part of it. You ever look at a hamster and they just run on the wheel? It's like, what are they thinking? I mean, if I was that much cozy up in that little bed of whatever, wood chips, and I'd sit underneath that thing, I would make my bed right underneath the food dish. And I'd just have to turn my neck. Want my water? Want my food? Why do they sit there and they run? I have no idea. I have no idea. But that is the rat race. It's just doing the same thing over and over again. So we have to know what it is we're supposed to be doing and why it is we're supposed to be doing what it is we're supposed to be doing. And I tell you, when you figure those two things out, that is exciting. The purpose is the practice behind the principle. The purpose is the practice behind the principle. 
Friends, you're not going to keep doing what you're supposed to be doing very long if you don't have a purpose. And you are going to hate every minute of it. When people stop doing what they're supposed to be doing, you've got to ask the question, right? Why did you stop doing that? January 15th, ask everybody, why did you stop? Have you been exercising? Well, I started. Well, did you have a destination? Well, yeah, I wanted to look like Arnold. Okay, why did you want to look like Arnold? Because he looks good. Okay. Why did you want to look like Arnold? When you, when you bore down, when you, when you find the very, very basis for our purpose, it has to make sense. If it doesn't make sense, why would a guy want to look like Arnold? I'd have chosen not to look like Arnold, as you can tell. My wife agrees with that, by the way. We have to find our purpose in life. We have to find our purpose when it comes to our marriage, when it comes to our kids. I am so sick and tired of people saying, well, that's what I had kids for. They're out there shoveling, you know, and mowing. That's what we had kids for. No, you didn't have kids for that. And if you did, you got some problems, and I want to talk to you after church. That is not why you had kids. So stop making that up. That's false. That's, that's phony. You had kids for a different reason. Whatever that reason is, figure it out. But it's not so they can shovel your driveway, or to clean your car, or to wash the dishes, or to vacuum the carpet. We've got to figure out what God has for us in our marriage. What's the purpose of marriage? What's the purpose of kids? What's the purpose of our finances? What's the purpose of our health? What's the purpose of our body? What's the purpose of this building? What's the, what's the purpose of the Bible? And we're going to talk about that. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to literally uncover all of these awesome things. Because, listen, if you came here this morning under coercion, <laughs> which I don't think any of y'all did, we have a problem. There is a reason why you came here. If you came here because you want to know more about God, that's the right reason. But it goes deeper than that. He goes much deeper than that. And that's what we're going to talk about. Three main things that knowing your purpose will do for your life. Three main things. Here it is. It brings clarity to your life. It brings clarity. We all like to see clearly. I love to see clearly. I have, uh, I have razor sharp vision. It's actually kind of pathetic. It's so good. Right now, now I might be struck blind this afternoon. I hope not. I've got crystal clear vision. I remember because of my, I had a lupus flare-up. I had iritis. And so I went to the doctor, and they gave me the steroid drops in my eye. And uh, I came back and a couple weeks later. I said, do a follow-up in a couple weeks. I came back, and I was telling Dana, I said, I can't see anything. I said, my vision is so messed up. I said, I can't see anything. I can't see anything. It's all blurry. And she's like, well, yeah, see, that's how I have to, see, that's what I have to. That's how I feel. And I couldn't see. And I, I got there in the optometrist. Is that what they are? Yeah, he's looking in my eyes, and he says, all right, we're going to have to do an eye exam. It doesn't look like there's anything in there. And I, I was like, oh, I can't see. You know, oh, it's just hurting. And I said, it's just so fuzzy. And they said, well, tell me which line you can read. I said, well, I can read the bottom. It's ZX, Y, C, C, 4, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And he says, that's 2020 vision. And I said, yeah, but I tell you, I can't see anything. And he says, <laughs> You mean you can't see anything with 20-20 vision? I said, no, I'm, I'm all fuzzy. Like, I can't see. It's all, it's all just pixelated. Looks like I'm watching an old black and white, which I try not to do. And he said, I said, it's really fuzzy. And he says, well, that's 20-20 vision. Well, we, we, we did the test. It's like 2010 and like 2015. I like razor crisp. Now, we like to see with clarity. We like to see with clarity. And when you find your purpose in life, you'll see perfectly. You'll see with such clarity what your goals are. What is my objective? What's the, what's the end game? Is it just running around in a hamster wheel, a rat race? Is it just doing the same thing over and over? I get up, I eat, I go to work. I come home, I eat, I go to bed. Boring. There's more to life than that. And I tell you what, I tell you what, the hamster knows that, right? All it takes is a jailbreak from the hamster, and he is all over the place. You can't find that little weasel. We had... 
I had, we had, we were, is it, can I say hamster sitting? It's, I know, it's not a joke. We were hamster sitting for someone, and it had a little jailbreak. We lost six hamsters in our house. <laughs> and they were just little bitty guys. And you're like, uh, what happened? And she's like, I don't know, they just got out. I'm like, they didn't just open the door with their little claws. It's a discussion my wife and I had. I said, where, where, where were they? And they were here, and they just got out. I mean, they, she found them all, praise the Lord. Because hamsters, they just kind of duplicate. <laughs> just saying. You don't want a bunch of hamsters in your house, okay? They know that there's more to life than this. And so they get out of a little, little one foot, you know, little space, and they are all over the place. You can't find them. It brings clarity to your life, and it keeps you focused. It keeps you focused. You'll be able to keep doing what it is you're doing because you've, you're focused. Clarity is one thing. Knowing what you're looking at, staying focused as that object moves around is a whole other thing. And lastly, it adds passion. So it brings clarity, it keeps you focused, and it adds passion. You ever find people who are just passionate about their jobs, who just love doing what it is they do? You find people like that? who just are excited to get up and go to work. And they, and they use phrases like this. If you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, right? And these are the people that you have to set an alarm clock to go to bed because they just want to keep working. They just love working so much. They found their purpose in life. And they're passionate. They're excited. And you can see it. They ooze the passion. They just love what they do. They found exactly what it is they are supposed to do. When I found what I was supposed to do, I was so excited. It all started when, when I began to have a relationship with God. When I began to have a relationship with God, when I began to under, understand Him and know Him, and I knew what it felt like to me. The only thing that made sense was me trying to tell you how to have you have that same feeling. I want you to experience God like I experience God. That's my passion. That's my purpose. Not just eternally. Not just, not just eternally. But temporally too. I want you to have that same joy and fulfillment in your life that I have in mine. Now, of course, I want yours to be better than me. But I want you to at least have the same. Because I know what it's like to know my God. I know what it's like to know where I'm going when I die. And quite frankly, there's nothing more important than that question. 70 to 80 years, you're alive. You're dead forever. Make it count. And friends, if you, somebody here today doesn't know where they're going when they die, if they aren't absolutely certain, you can know for sure. You can know for sure where you're going when you die. That's where purpose really starts. Because life is short. It's one car accident away. It's one fire away. It's one slip and fall away. Life is short. And if you're here today, you don't know Christ as your Savior. Before we take communion, I just want to show you this. I want this hand right here to represent you and me. And I want this billfold right here to represent all of our sin. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we all have sin. The Bible says that God loves us but hates our sin. The Bible says that there is a price that we have to pay for our sin. Here's what it says. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The Bible doesn't say the wages of sin is church membership or water baptism or confessing all of your sin. The wages of sin is death. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for our sin. The wages of sin was death. Someone has to die. Either we die and spend an eternity separated from God, paying for our sin, or we trust, this is what the Bible says, for by grace are you saved 
through faith, not works. The Bible condemns that. The Bible says that we're not saved by works. Not by works, this is what the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his righteousness, according to his work, according to the job that he has done, not the jobs we do, not the things we, we not, not praying, not raising a hand, not walking an aisle, or taking communion. We're saved because we place our faith in Jesus Christ alone to save us. And he gives us eternal life because of it. It's the most marvelous truth of all. That we can know where we're going when we die. And it was that Jesus paid for it. We don't do anything. It was his mercy that saves us. It was his work, not mine. It was what he did, not what I do. Being good is good, but being good isn't good enough to get you to heaven. We have to trust someone else, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins. If you're here today and you have not done that, I'm just asking you that you would trust Christ as your personal Savior. That in the quietness of your own mind, you might say something simple like this. A prayer doesn't save you. This is you and God. Where you might say to God, Lord, the best I know how, I'm placing my faith in you as my personal Savior. If you believe that today, friends, you are saved. You're going to heaven when you die. What a remarkable thing. We're not just here just to live and die. We're here to have a relationship with God. That's what we're here for. But it's much more than that. 